This is the legacy interview of Justice Gabriel Sanchez. I'm Justice Sandy Margulies of the First District Court of Appeal. And uh, Justice Sanchez has graciously agreed uh, to uh, interview. He's currently a member, uh, a justice of the Federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. So thank you very much for agreeing to uh, have me conduct this interview with you. And I'd like to start out with sort of an easy question. Where were you born? Ah, I was born in Fullerton, California, uh, one of the neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And how long did you live there? I was born uh, to a single mother. And the two of us lived in uh, Los Angeles with a uh, family that took her in uh, for about one and a half years. And then we moved back to, or moved, I moved to Mexico, to Guadalajara, uh, and lived in Mexico for a couple of years in Guadalajara. This is really at the cusp of when I started remembering things or having memories. So how old were you? I was uh, probably in the neighborhood of one to three years old or one to four years old in Mexico. And with whom did you live? It was uh, my mother and I in an apartment uh, that my father maintained for us. And, uh, and we lived there for a, a few years and then came back to the United States and uh, lived with my grandparents uh, in Los Angeles and in a neighborhood called Hacienda Heights. And um, was that just you and your mother in Hacienda? It was just, my, just me and my mother. Uh, in uh, living in Los Angeles uh, during that stretch of time all the way. And then, and then I, eventually I moved to different neighborhoods within Los Angeles, but that was, that was the first one. And uh, what other neighborhoods did you live in in Los Angeles? It, so initially uh, in, with my grandparents in Hacienda Heights, that went up until fifth grade of elementary school. And then my mother moved to Brentwood to be closer to a, um, a school called University Elementary School in, in, in Los Angeles, UES, which is um, a, uh, a type, uh, a research school for part of UCLA campus, a really special, wonderful school that I, that I attended there. Uh, and uh, because my mother cared about my education, she would drive 30 miles each way to drop me off at the school initially in the fourth grade. And eventually that became too difficult. And so she was able to take on a, a caretaker role uh, for a family in Brentwood. And so that's how we were able to live closer to the school. And um, what was your mother's occupation or occupations? She was uh, different occupations. Uh, I would say that one of her strengths was in dress design uh, and being a seamstress and she would design wedding dresses, for example, and other things. And she had learned this craft when she was in Mexico uh, and, uh, and did some of it in Los Angeles. But mostly when we were in Los Angeles, just her and I, it was, uh, she would be a caretaker. She had a few different, uh, she cut hair, she was a hairdresser. Uh, a middle class existence or, or, or lower middle class existence to just try to keep us going. And um, where, where did you go to high school out of curiosity? I went to Harvard Westlake. Uh, oh, you so, went, that's right. You've told me that before. Yes. So that's that started uh, in seventh grade. And initially before the school merged to a, an all girls school, it was just a Harvard school for boys. And so I went there from seventh grade to 12th grade. And... Um, Harvard Westlake, uh, my understanding is, uh, is um, uh, has a very rigorous curriculum, uh, and uh, students place very well into universities from Harvard Westlake. It is. It's it's a it's an, a school that pours itself into its academics and sports. I was a scholarship student there. And I was, I think, maybe one of their first scholarship students that I, I had a full ride at, at the school from seventh grade on. And, and they were generous enough that they would also pay for meals. Uh, I learned how to ski 
uh, they took me on paid ski trips <laughs> in the seventh grade, all the way, you know, for many years uh, through Harvard Westlake. Uh, it, it was it was a wonderful place. They they gave me many opportunities. Yeah. Yes. My understanding now is they give out a, a number of uh, scholarships, um, and I only say that because I have grand nephews who have both graduated from there. Uh, are you still skiing, by the way? I do still ski. In fact, we have a trip planned for like for Tahoe. It's our, our typical February trip in the middle of the month that we that we go off skiing. Um, how did you get to the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where you currently live? My wife, uh, she, Christina Meyer, she grew up in the Bay Area in Orinda. We met in college at Yale uh, our freshman year. And uh, eventually, I will, I'm sure I'll go into the story a little bit further on, but uh, while we were engaged, uh, there was a time that we, we were moving back, we had moved back to Los Angeles, uh, and uh, she was doing a public policy degree at the Goldman School in Berkeley. And I was still in Los Angeles working at a law firm, and, uh, and we were doing a little bit of commuting, and eventually it became a little bit difficult to maintain that community existence. And so I asked my law firm if I could transfer to their San Francisco office, and I came to the Bay Area to live in January of 2006, and I have been here since. And um, since we're speaking about your spouse, what is Chris's occupation? Chris is, uh, it, she runs her family's real estate development business. Uh, and so her father has a very interesting story, Jay Meyer. He was the founder and president of one of the principal savings and loans on the West Coast at one point in time. Uh, called Fidelity. Oh, yes. Uh, and at, uh, at a certain stage, he had to give up control of Fidelity because of it was during the period of stagflation and, and, the, and the raising of interest rates under, under Paul Volcker. And, uh, and the way he recovered from having to let go of all that was to uh, switch gears and, and uh, buy real estate holdings and and, and many of those, some of them he developed and others remained raw land. And uh, after he passed away in 2010, the responsibility fell on, on my wife, Chris's shoulders and, and her mother. And together they, you know, made their way through. And, and so she uh, is principally one of the people that helps with, uh, with, with the family business and with so, development opportunities. So what sort of projects have they developed over the years? She's in the process of potentially developing a, a, a hotel in, in, a, in a Bay Area city. Uh, and for the most part, I would say it's, um, there haven't been that many projects. It was the transition occurred gradually from her father and, and what they were doing. So it was maintaining some of the current projects or, or, or current developments that they already had. And, uh, but on the horizon are, are several things in development that she's in, excited about. So you have one son. Yes. I refer to him as the fabulous Conrad, who I've met. And uh, he's in fifth grade now? He's in fifth grade. And um, I know Conrad reads a lot. And what other interests does he have? Conrad is uh, a voracious reader. He loves to learn. Uh, and so he's, um, he plays the violin at a very advanced age. He's been playing since the age of four. He's now 11. Uh, he uh, loves playing tennis. Uh, he loves math. He loves, he's very involved in Dungeons and Dragons now. And so I had my old Dungeons very, and very Dragons Very age books, appropriate. <laughs> very much so. So he, he, he likes to do uh, role playing adventures with his friends. Uh, but he gets out a lot and, and plays many different sports and just enjoys reading and, and learning about many different things. And, and it sounds like to me he may have, um, could potentially go into the legal field because I understand he's honed his negotiation skills when it comes to practicing the violin. It, among other things, it, many things are a negotiation. And, you know, ever since I became a judge, uh, he has had an interest in the legal process and, and you know, some of my former cases, even here in division one, he would want to map out the different sides with me and decide what were the arguments that were being raised and, and, and why did someone win and why. Uh, so 
he, he has that interest and, and a certain level of understanding of what goes on, what, what our jobs are. Uh, and so who knows, maybe, maybe that will be his future profession as well. Or he could fully even go into medicine. Right. Um, so we've talked about you went to Harvard Westlake in high school. And after we Harvard Westlake, you attended which college? I went to Yale College, to Yale University in and New Haven. What was your major? I was a double major in political science and international studies. Uh, and um, how would you describe your experience at uh, Yale? I loved Yale. Uh, I, you know, I decided to go there sight unseen because uh, I have an Aunt Martha who's been a, an important mentor in my life. And she was one of the first uh, women to attend Yale. Uh, and, and there's an interesting full circle uh, story that she was a junior in, at Yale when I was born. And, uh, and then eventually her son Llewellyn was born and I was a junior at Yale when he was born. And so I, just from hearing the stories about Yale and, and, and just how much she loved it, decided to apply early and accepted and uh, without ever doing a college visit, I just somehow knew that I, I had an affinity to it. And, and luckily enough, that turned out to be the, tr the truth. Now, were you involved in, uh, or active in any groups or organizations while you attended Yale? Yes. Uh, so I was involved in several different ones. But uh, one of the main ones was a society called St. Anthony Hall. Uh, it was a three-year society. Unlike, so Yale has some senior societies that are just the final year of college, but we were uh, a group that uh, would get together every week starting in our sophomore year and really uh, intellectually uh, invigorated each other and told each other our life stories. And it was a very um, enriching environment in, in many different ways. And some of my best friends are still from, from St. A's. So I, 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 I did St. Anthony Hall. I, uh, I was also part of the uh, Mexican-American student group called Mecha at Yale. And, uh, and you know, we were very politically active. I remember one time that we uh, organized a grape boycott of the Yale dining halls based on the con farming conditions in California and, and many people were thinking, why, why are we boycotting grapes over something that happened far away? But uh, I think we did our best to try to educate people about the importance of, of labor conditions in, in different parts of the country and, and the role that students could play in them. So Mecha was another student organization. I, I was on work study. And so uh, a part of my time there was also working to defray costs of tuition and, and, and student loans. So what jobs did you hold? <laughs> it, it varied. It, I worked in the French department one year. Uh, I worked uh, at the one of the libraries. And I worked at the uh, British Art Museum uh, gift shop for a couple <laughs> of years, which, which was fun and, and fairly, fairly easy to do. Uh, sit around and read and occasionally package uh, ceramic pots that people would buy. Now, uh, following Yale, um, you became a Fulbright Scholar, is that correct? Yes. And what year was that? So I graduated from Yale in 1998. And to preface this, I have always loved traveling. You and I have that in common. Yes, we do. And uh, so after college, I, my best friend and I backpacked through Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and throughout college and, and even parts of high school, I, every opportunity that I had to do foreign study or, or a program abroad, I would do that. And so when it came time, I knew that I wanted to apply to a Fulbright. And, uh, and the reason why I chose Argentina was interesting. I, uh, a summer before, I had interned at a political consultancy in Washington, D.C., and uh, one of the governors of uh, the governor of Buenos Aires province had asked if the firm could represent him. And, ult and so they asked me to look into this person. And ultimately, I, uh, they didn't accept uh, representing him. I think he wanted a more lobbying type relationship. But it piqued my interest thinking, why, why would these Argentinian politicians want to hire American political consultants? And what I came to realize was that one of the many exports that the U.S. has is 
American political consultancy and, and, and campaigns abroad. And it, um, it made me interested in thinking about, well, if, if this is going on, how does that affect Argentinian democracy? And so when I did my Fulbright in 1999, it was during the presidential election cycle, and the two leading candidates had hired American consultants. I think one of them was James Carville, and the other one was Dick Morris. So I, I wrote my work on American political consultancy and its effect on Argentina, which had recently come out of a dictatorship only, only several years before. So were you living in Buenos Aires? I was living in Buenos Aires. And uh, who were the two presidential candidates? Uh, it was the mayor of Buenos Aires capital, named, uh, a man named De La Rua, who was uh, a very staid and kind of boring politician. And the other one uh, was named Dualde, uh, who was the governor of Buenos Aires province and, uh, and, and part of the leading party that had been a part of, um, you know, Perón and, and, and Eva Perón and others. Oh, really? And, uh, and, and they were running political style campaign advertisements. And uh, my initial conclusion was, this is not a good thing uh, to have these, uh, campaigns be more about the personalities and less about the these democratic institutions that are important to the to especially to a nascent democracy to one that had just come out of a military dictatorship after many years so uh, who ultimately won the election de la rua but it, it it presaged what would come with argentina was about to face a very tough stretch and has still been in a financial crisis uh, at the time they were pegged to the dollar and Eventually, they had to decide to unpeg and, and you know, reap the consequences of, of doing so. But it's the economics turned into a fair bit of political turmoil in, 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 in following years. So did you live in Argentina for a year? I lived in Argentina for a year. And did you do any traveling while you were in Argentina? Quite a bit. Uh, so I, uh, to Brazil, to Uruguay, uh, to um, Peru, uh, parts of Chile, uh, wherever I could go. Interestingly enough, the Fulbright Commission, I, did, I was not on a regular visa for the year. And so what the Fulbright Commission recommended was for, the, for us Fulbright attendees was to leave the country every three months and get a new stamp. And so I would go to Uruguay, to Montevideo, every few months to get a new stamp up on my passport and to come back in as a tourist. I see. So I, I, I figured if the, if the US government Fulbright Commission is sanctioning this, then it, it was must be okay. okay. <laughs> um, so when you were done uh, with your Fulbright, Fulbright scholarship in Argentina, you went somewhere else. You weren't, I, done, you weren't done with your education. No, I went to Cambridge. So I went to the University of Cambridge and I started- In England. A, in England. And I started a, an MPhil program in European studies. And uh, did you complete the program? I did. It was a one-year master's. And so you came out with a master's in? European, well, it, uh, the degree is an MPhil, a master's of philosophy, but That's it was an MPhil in European studies was, was the degree. So um, after you were done at the University of Cambridge, uh, did you decide to go to law school? Did you pursue a career? What I decided because of my twin loves in the law and international diplomacy, international relations, was that I would decide, I would, I would postpone that decision. And so I, before I left on these trips, I took the LSAT and put that to one side and then had these experiences and, and decided whether I wanted to apply to law school at that point or, or delay it a little bit further or go into the State Department and do something completely different. When I was in Cambridge, uh, I, uh, was recruited into McKinsey and Company, the consultancy firm. I'm actually familiar with that because our nephew is being recruited currently. He's getting an MBA. So. And what was interesting about McKinsey was that they were standing up uh, a practice group called the Global Strat Strategy Practice, mm -hmm. which was a bit independent of their usual model, which is focused on the different offices from their cities. And so that intrigued me because it was... It, it just it, it combined all the different interests that I had with with uh, global and international relations and and uh, and 
helping tease out and analyze problems and, and how to solve them. And so I, I went into McKinsey. My, to, to my advisor's chagrin, Dr. Rothschild, who um, was at uh, King's College. Um, at Cambridge. At Cambridge. She wanted me to can stay on for a PhD uh, in, in the work that I had been doing. And I ultimately decided that I wanted something l a little less isolating, a little bit more involved and, and, and uh, with more action and more travel. And so I decided to join McKinsey and, and, and uh, work in the global strategy practice, but out of the New York office. And how long were you there for? I was there for a little under two years. The first year was very exciting, very active, many different engagements. And then the dot-com bubble hit, the crash. And so the second year slowed down quite a bit. And so the engagements dried up a little bit and it wasn't as uh, interesting anymore and not as much work. And, and, and I think that's when I decided, you know, it's time to apply to law school and, and leave that possible path behind and, and try something different. So where did you attend law school? I attended Yale. I went back to Yale. And um, did you have any favorite professors or courses uh, in law school? I, I love the school overall. I, if I had to pick certain favorites, I uh, Guido Calabresi, Judge Calabresi on the Second Circuit and, and uh, Judge John Walker on uh, the Second Circuit had a seminar on uh, Supreme Court litigation, which I loved because it was looking at existing cases on the, on the Supreme Court docket and, and arguing those arguments ourselves with our fellow students. Uh, I loved uh, constitutional law with Akhil Amar. Uh, I loved my criminal law class with Dan Kahan. Uh, th those are a few that stand out. But there, but there were so many. It was, it was a wonderful experience. Were you active in any organizations and or groups while at Yale Law School? I was most active in the Latino Law Students Association. And I, I, th I think I, at some point I held one of the chairships. I'm trying to remember which one it was. <laughs> it, it's a little bit vague in my mind now. That's okay. <laughs> um, so while you were in law school, was Becoming a member of the judiciary on your radar screen at that time? Not specifically. I think if it, to harken back to Teddy Roosevelt's idea of uh, being in the, in the political arena, I, was, I felt myself more suited in wanting to be involved in things that would make a positive difference for society. Uh, and, and, and in that sense, I, I thought more of litigation, of, of being a practicing lawyer, of working on impact cases, learning the craft of, of being a lawyer, and had not, or, or entering politics that had been in the back of my mind as well. But I had not thought as much about being serving on the bench. That was not at the forefront of my mind. It, it, it was a consideration, but, but not one that was at the forefront of my mind at that point. So uh, you graduated from Yale. Where did you take the bar exam? I took the bar in Oxnard, California. And why did you come back to California? I knew I wanted to come back to California. Uh, it, I knew that I wanted to return. I, I had been living in New York and, and abroad for many, many years, but I knew that, my, that the gravity would bring me back to California and that I wanted to do things to improve our communities in, in California in, in whatever way I could. So uh, you passed the bar exam, and what was your first position after passing the bar exam? I was clerking for Judge Richard Paez in the Ninth Circuit in Pasadena, and so that my first legal position was serving him as a law clerk that year. And, and um, Judge Paez had been a district court judge before he was elevated to the Ninth Circuit. He was a, a superior court judge Correct. and then went to the district court and then was elevated to the Ninth Circuit. So he had the complete vantage point of the different levels of... Yeah, the only reason I asked is he was a contemporary of mine mm. when I was on the superior court. Um, so um, how long did you clerk for uh, 
Judge Pius? One year. It was in the uh, 2005, 2006 term. And this was in Los Angeles? In Los in Pasadena, in Los Angeles. And what were your responsibilities? Uh, researching the cases that came before us, drafting bench memoranda, basically what I have my law clerks do now. Uh, attending the oral arguments, writing the opinions and, or dispositions that followed the arguments, uh, helping research with on banks uh, as well when, when those votes come up. Um, did you enjoy the experience? I loved it. It was, uh, many people talk about a clerkship as, as being such a wonderful opening to a legal career, and, it, and it's true. And I couldn't have asked for a better judge to clerk for. Uh, judge Pius's law clerks are you know, legendarily loyal to him because he is one of the nicest people with integrity and, and just comports himself in the right way as, as a judge. Uh, and, and so I learned so many things from him about legal advocacy, about writing, about uh, the integrity of, of being a judge. Uh, uh, things that I, th I think still filter through my own work today. So after you completed your clerkship, did you join a law firm? I did, I joined uh, a law firm, Munger, Tolls & Olson, that had, I had summered in, in one of the summers there. Did being a clerk with uh, Judge Piaz um, help or prepare you in any way for the practice of law with a large law firm? It did. Uh, he taught me how to write, or he improved my writing. Yeah. He, and just having the vantage point of seeing what makes, what, on what basis judges make decisions and, and what are more effective ways to advocate for a client's position uh, or, or, or an argument itself. All, all those things are in, invaluable when you start the legal profession and, and you have a sense when you are writing briefs or motions to dismiss or, or, or other pleadings, what's going to catch a judge's attention, what is the best way to frame an issue and, and, uh, and concisely bring across that issue to busy judges that have to make decisions uh, uh, in, in some ways based on what you are writing for them. So it sounds like to me, um, clerking for Judge Pius, uh, you were I would say the vantage point to see what you should or should not do as a practicing attorney. I think so because I had had a year's worth of seeing what worked and what didn't with, with either effective counsel or, 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 or short of that during that clerking year. So when you were with Munger Tolis, first of all, how long were you with the law firm? I was with them uh, for about five and a half years. And what was your area of focus? Uh, I would say complex civil litigation. It was class action work, uh, a number of different types of claims. Uh, some of the matters involved uh, defending um, companies uh, in, in class actions, uh, others uh, uh, related to uh, False Claims Act and state law claims. It, really interesting work uh, of, of a wide variety and uh, very high level lawyering and, and brief writing. Uh, and, and, and some of my former colleagues from Munger are now my colleagues on the Ninth Circuit. And so it, it, it really was a great proving ground for uh, honing the skills of effective lawyering. Were you in court very much or was it mostly you were doing a lot of briefing and legal research? I was in court uh, more on my pro bono matters which we're going to not, get into. Not as frequently on, 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 the, on some of the other matters. And, and that, I think, played a role in my deciding eventually to leave the firm in order to gain some more of that trial court experience. So speaking of your pro bono work, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, Batista versus State of California case? Sure. I, I'm very proud of that case. It was involved, uh, what started it was there was a young woman who was 17 years old who died of heat exposure in the, in the fields, and she was not the first. This is uh, at farm fields. In, in, the, in, in California, in, central, in the Central Valley. And uh, there, was, in the, there had been many farm workers that had died from uh, heat exposure. And at the time, the state agency responsible for uh, labor codes enforcement 
I did not think, and others, we did not think were doing an effective enough job enforcing uh, a, a, a recent heat regulation that was adopted. And we also thought that the heat regulation was in not adequate enough to, to serve the, the risks that were happening. And so I, with other fellow part, uh, lawyers at Munger, uh, with the ACLU of Southern California and, and public counsel, we decided to, you know, we, we sued the state of California in order to try to enforce and improve those regulations and the enforcement of those regulations on behalf of farm workers, rather than go after individual farmers and growers, but after the agency that would be tasked with trying to maintain a better level of uh, working conditions for people. And did this have to do with hydration, shade? Yes. It, so I, I took a principal role in, in drafting a, a very long, I think, 60-page complaint. And, and one of the things that I did was that I looked at the U.S. Army and their own training manuals for heat illness prevention because the U.S. Army understood that with the amount of investment you have for soldiers, you don't want them to die during trainings and that you need to make sure of the ambient temperature and sufficient water and shade and to stop activity you know, when, when certain things happen. And so I incorporated many of those principles and ideas into our complaint as things to do to try to improve the, uh, the, the heat regulation itself and to bring attention to the inadequate enforcement that was happening with, with Cal OSHA. So in, did you file, well, in which court did you file the? Uh, Law Essential Superior Court. And um, how long did the litigation go on for? It went many years. In fact, it, it post-dated me even after I left Munger and, and we'll get to this, you know, when I eventually arrived to the governor's office, uh, under a different administration at this point. The, right. the case was still ongoing, and so some of my colleagues at the governor's office had to deal with the lawsuit that I had initiated, so I was walled off from any discussion. I'm sure you uh, were. Related to that, but it, it was finally settled uh, in, uh, I guess, a few years after I had started at the governor's office, uh, and, I, and I think did an important job of uh, of protecting people's lives in, in, in very common sense sort of ways that uh, that was just good to see. I, I remember those times that I was driving into the fields with my co-counsel and, uh, and, and I had an audio book of Parting the Waters about the civil rights movement uh, playing while I was uh, driving over there and thinking, let me just try to do my part to meet with people and, uh, and have their stories be told and, and try to improve their conditions uh, of those that had not, who, you know, who didn't have the connections to these law firms that, that others do. How, how did this issue come to your attention? Uh, it was already on the attention of the ACLU. The United Farm Workers brought it to them. So the United Farm Workers was one of the defendants, an organizational defendant, along with individual, uh, not defendant, plaintiff, along with individual plaintiffs. And, and we were the ones that found the individual plaintiffs who were willing to come forward and help. And So did the ACLU contact uh, your law firm? Or? Yes. Okay. As co-counsel. And uh, you actually received an award from the ACLU as, as a result of your work on Batista. I did. And uh, what was the oh. award for? Uh, it was the Social Justice Award. I and some fellow colleagues that had worked on, on the case together at, at Munger received the award together. Uh, and it was just in recognition of all the work that we had done to, um, to carry this litigation forward and, and, and try to bring it to a, uh, an appropriate resolution that, that helped everyone. And did you feel uh, there was an appropriate or satisfactory resolution? I do, I do. Interestingly enough, uh, I, one of the claims that we brought was a constitutional claim that was dismissed by the trial court uh, and, and, uh, and that dismissal was affirmed by the uh, second district court of appeals and, and I, I completely understand why. <laughs> okay. Uh, but it, nonetheless, I think the statutory claims that we raised and, and the attention that we paid to the issues and, and the information that we brought uh, to bear on the case. For example, I, at one point I, I, I found and located a heat sensor 
and, and brought it with me to a meeting to the governor's office under Governor Schwarzenegger at the time to just show them how easy it was to be able to buy these things and to get a sense of the ambient temperature uh, uh, of, of the fields, you know, to be able to use it. So in, in, in different ways, we were trying to persuade and cajole and, uh, and uh, enforce appropriate action from the agencies in order to address, to, to adequately address this issue. Was a settlement reached in the matter or was there actually a judicial ruling? The settlement, so there was, there was that initial judicial ruling that, that allowed the statutory claim to go forward and not the constitutional claim, uh, which, uh, and so then the, the case proceeded and, and was continuing on. And, and uh, after my time, I was not involved in the settlement because at that point I was, as I said, walled off and no longer part of Munger or on, of either side. Uh, that's when the settlement was, was reached. So after you left uh, Munger Tolis, where did you go? I went to the California Department of Justice to the Attorney General's office in the correctional law section. And uh, so you were Deputy Attorney General? I was. And why the correctional law section? Because that seems totally different. different from what you had been doing. It was. So this harkens back to uh, the question you had asked about how often was I in the courtroom. And uh, the answer was not often enough. And correctional, when I was looking at different opportunities within, within the sections of the Attorney General's office, correctional law struck my eye because it, uh, it dealt with many federal claims, more litigated issues, and, and the opportunity to be present in court more frequently. And so I thought, you know, I don't know much about correctional law at all, but that seems interesting and, I, and, I'll, and I'll be in court more frequently. So were you defending uh, the correctional facilities? Cor defending either the governor's office or uh, correctional facilities or the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Th those were the typical defendants. And can you tell me about the Coleman v. Brown case and uh, three judge court case? So that, that, that was where my best laid plans were derailed a bit because what I had wanted to do was uh, attend court and try cases and instead, given my background in many class action case law, I was pulled into these complex class action cases, these long-standing cases uh, related to uh, federal class actions. And Coleman is one of them. It relates to the delivery of mental health care in the prison system. And Plata is another about the medical care in the prison system. And the three-judge court case is one that combines the two, but really addressed that the reason why the state was not able to fulfill its constitutional obligations was because the prisons were overcrowded. And, and, that, and, the, and there was a resulting uh, three-judge court order to reduce the prison population. Uh, and so my role, I, I became one of the lead attorneys at the Attorney General's office on these cases, and, and my role was to try to help have the state reach its uh, constitutional obligations and try to wrap up these cases at the same time because they, they were longstanding. I think Coleman be, was, began in 1990 and is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. And Plata began, I wanna say in the year 2000, but it was under a, a federal receivership. And so federal court inter intervention was necessary in order to accomplish these objectives, but it was also something where at just for a matter of public fisc and, and, and policy as a whole, the state has to come out from under these cases and, and, uh, and fulfill their obligations and, and wrap them up in, in, in an appropriate way. And so that my, my task was to try to get the clients to get into that place and to help persuade the courts that it was time to end things. Was Judge Felton Henderson involved in these cases? Judge Henderson was involved in the Plata case for many, many years. And, uh, and Judge Larry Carlton, before he passed away, was involved in the Coleman case for, for many years. And, and Judge Mueller has taken over the Coleman case. Uh, and, uh, and Judge Tiger has taken over the Plata case. Now, was, uh, when you were in the Attorney General's office, was um, Jerry Brown the Attorney General at that point? Not at that point. It was uh, uh, Kamala Harris was the Attorney General. And so I, those were some of my main tasks, and, uh, but I also worked on some other 
specific projects for Attorney General Harris related to realignment as well. But, but the, the, in the main, I was working on this class action work. And because my work uh, involved frequent interaction with the governor's office in that year in 2011, it was at the start of the Brown administration, uh, they uh, asked me to consider applying for a position with them. Uh, and so I did, I applied with them and I interviewed with them and eventually was hired or offered a position with the governor's office of legal affairs. So before we get to that, for how long were you with the attorney general's office? It was a short amount of time. It was only a year. It might've been, been even less than a year. And, and that had not been my intention. I, I was planning to be at the attorney general's office for a fair bit longer, but um, the opportunity to work for Governor Brown was a difficult one and, and to pass up on. So was this 2011 when you applied? This was 2011 uh, and I began with Governor Brown in 2012. And you were one of the legal affairs advisors? I was one of the, uh, de that's right, deputy legal affairs secretary was my title. Uh, and what did you do as a deputy legal affairs secretary? So. Initially, when I came on, it was to oversee the governor's parole review process and to stand up a team of, uh, of younger attorneys to, uh, to review the parole decision make, the, the parole decisions by the Board of Parole Hearings and to review those decisions for Governor Brown on a weekly basis. And so I helped stand up that whole process. Uh, but even while that was happening, I was asked to move back into the work that I had been doing before on the class action work. And eventually it just, uh, what, one of the um, wonderful things about Governor Brown is that he doesn't stand for hierarchy that much. And so where there was a need, there was an opportunity to fill that vacuum to, to do more. And, and uh, eventually it became a very integral role. I played an integral role in, in, uh, in uh, advising him on criminal justice reforms and, and, and having a much broader portfolio than, than I had started with. Um, so in what e other areas uh, were you involved in in terms of criminal justice reform? Um, I'm thinking specifically in uh, implementing the Public Safety and Rehabilitation Act of 2016. It, it culminated in, in the passage of that ballot measure what I would say was that much of my work with the class actions uh, involved both legal expertise and experience and, and, and the legal claims that, that were arising in those cases, but also the learning the policy side of it and learning the, the procedures and, and the regulations that Department of Corrections and Department of State Hospitals uh, employed in order to try to be in compliance. And, and so it really required becoming a policy expert in this area as well. And what that led to, and, and with Governor Brown's enormous interest in this area, was also learning about sentencing laws and the way that um, uh, cream, penal code provisions had been enacted or, or sentencing provisions and and to look at the broad structure of the criminal justice system writ large from the types of laws that had been enacted over, over these decades to the type of regulations that were being written, uh, all with an eye toward how do we get the state to come into constitutional compliance and bring down the prison population in a safe way without just outright releases, but properly incentivizing uh, our state inmates to rehabilitate and to prove their merit for, for being um, granted parole and released. So what were some of the strategies? So for example, I, I took a close look and I, and I, one of the things that I would do is I would consult with many academics. And so it, it was reaching out to academia, reaching out to practitioners, to prosecutors, to public defenders, uh, the panoply of, of interest in this, uh, in the, to, to law enforcement and, and, and corrections officials. To, to try to figure out how to best accomplish these objectives that the, that the federal courts had required the state to do. Uh, and so, for example, uh, we knew that with the three strikes law, there were a number of people that were coming in 
uh, for, for types of offenses where their second strike was doubling their, their prison sentence or, or a third strike for certain things. And like petty theft with the prior conviction. For example, yes. And, and seeing are there places where notwithstanding the sentence that they had received, the state could implement through federal court order ways to allow people to earn credits toward their sentence where they had not, where those had not been eligible before, or to appear before the parole board and create a parole review process where the, where the board of parole hearings could review these individuals and determine if they had um, reached, met a benchmark of, of public safety that they could be safely released. And so much of this was uh, to try to comply with the court order, which was affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. It's the only time that the Supreme Court has ever affirmed a prisoner release uh, order by, by a three-judge court. And so it was important for the state to accomplish these objectives in a safe way. And, and much of my work were related to dealing with that. And, um, and more broadly with Governor Brown, you know, he, he was the governor that had uh, signed the Determinate Sentencing Act into existence in 1977. And so, and, and I, I, don't, I think it's fair to say that he views that decision with some regret because the, the state had had a fairly effective and uh, indeterminate sentencing policy for a while that was very stable. It had not grown the prison population. It had its critics and it had its problems in, in terms of the perception of arbitrariness and, and perhaps some racial bias in, in the parole decision-making process, but it, we hadn't slipped into a phase, a, a kind of punitive phase where there are so many laws passed to add punishments, add new criminal uh, pro, uh, provisions, and reach a place where our prison system had reached 200% of its design capacity. I would, do you think that um, the reason uh, the determinate sentencing structure and, and statutes were enacted was to um, take away from the trial courts uh, a certain amount of discretion which the trial courts had been able to exercise previously? Not only the trial courts, but I think it, particularly the parole board. Mm -hmm. Because the trial courts under the indeterminate sentencing regime would just sentence someone to their period of term of five to life. Right. And then it was up to the parole board to decide what the actual sentence was going to be based on a real rehabilitation goal. And one of the very first lines of the Determinate Sentencing Act is, is that, that uh, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, that the, the purpose of incarceration was not rehabilitation, but for other, other purposes, um, you know, for uh, deterrence and for other, for other factors. And, and so there, you know, there is a, there's a logic to uh, determinate sentencing that provides swift and sure punishment uh, for, for particular crimes. But what it led to was a, a legislative reaction where just a, a constant ratcheting up. And, I, and, 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 uh, and in my view, at least, a lack of semblance of seeing the big picture of it so that each year new, pa new laws passing so that it, it became this... Uh, I think at one point I, I went back and looked with the help of AIDS that there were over 5,000 criminal provisions and 400 sentencing enhancements within the, within the code. And so what, I think what resulted from, the, from those changes was a, a, a shift in discretion more to prosecutors than, than other actors in the system, uh, especially with, with plea bargains. And so I think part of these efforts, in addition to, to complying with the federal court orders, was to establish a little bit more balance in the discretionary decision making. And so some of these things that we worked on, laws and others, was to reestablish more discretion for trial court judges, establish a little more discretion at the parole board level, uh, and, uh, and balance the system out a little bit more than it had been. I, would, would you... Do you think that um, currently a uh, state legislature has enacted uh, statutes or legislation which uh, is trying to ratchet down 
uh, what I would describe as the punitive nature of uh, previous uh, statutes? I think it has. I, I think it's it, it's been doing that over the last few years. It it started during my time at the governor's office uh, in incremental ways. Where, for example, uh, during my time, I, I participated in in uh, in reviewing a uh, a bill that became law to establish youth offender parole, uh, where again it, a parole byline where notwithstanding a person's sentence, a person, uh, you know, someone who had been convicted of, of serious crimes while they were uh, under a certain age uh, could obtain parole review. Now, that wasn't being released, but it was giving them a chance to be reviewed by the parole board. I which is by the age of 25? That's right. Yeah. That's right. It, it was... Things of that nature, which which would allow more discretion into the system, uh, that I think, and that discretion allows for incentivizing people to try to improve themselves. It doesn't work for everyone, but but that was that was, Governor Brown, I, I, you know, having had a Jesuit background, believed in the notion of of rehabilitation and, and the possibility of redemption. It doesn't occur with everyone, but. It was something that I, I think he imbued in our work and in, in, in his vision for trying to establish more a, a greater semblance of, of um, normalcy to, to the process. Um, before I leave our discussion about your time in the governor's office, I did want you, uh, or I'd like you to explain what the Public Safety and Rehabilitation Act of 2016 involved. So that popularly known as Proposition 57, it was a ballot measure that uh, uh, added uh, an article to the Constitution, to the California Constitution, cementing the things that we had done under the, uh, the three-judge court orders. The, it, was a, it was a ballot measure that the governor and I co-wrote uh, along with others. And the reason behind it was because uh, we had achieved these tremendous gains in lowering the prison population safely with no, with no changes in, in violent or property crimes. And we had accomplished the objective of, of what we set out to do for the federal courts. But the federal courts were also waiting to see if that was sustainable or, or if, if things would revert back. And, uh, and, there, and it was Governor Brown's idea to amend the constitution in order to cement these gains, in order to really enshrine within our constitution, the ability of uh, the Board of Parole hearings to, to pass these important regulations uh, that would allow that existing set of reforms, credit reforms, parole reforms, to remain there and not be subject to the vicissitudes of a different legislature right. or, 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 or other changes. So that, that was the reason why uh, it was proposed and the, the very act of proposing this ballot measure raised significant litigation, uh, e even in, in uh, putting it on, on, the, on the ballot for the November, I think, 2014 election, which we ultimately prevailed by through, a, through an emergency writ to the, Uni to the California Supreme Court and, uh, and ultimately saw it prevail uh, at, at, the, on the at the ballot box. And so that became something personally important to me uh, so that I would use my off time to help with with the uh, with questions raised about on, on the campaign side with it with, uh, with you know responding to press's questions about about this and responding to to different attacks or or, or um, different you, things about do it. Do you consider um, your work on Prop Fifty Seven uh, to be one of your major contributions while you were? Uh, working in Governor Brown's uh, office? I do, I do. It, it was not only the, the law itself, but the resulting regulations that were adopted after it. Uh, there was enormous input from different stakeholders from across the spectrum. Uh, governor, the governor and I met with so many different police groups, with corrections officials, with, uh, with prosecutors, with, with elected di district attorneys, they, uh, with uh, everyone, you know, probation officers, with people that were touched by, by this across the board with, with different interest groups. 
And, uh, and not surprisingly, with such a large undertaking, it, it had its detractors. I don't think it was a radical idea. I think it, it worked. The sky didn't fall. And ultimately, the people that, were, that, that, that we helped bring the prison population down um, had better outcomes than might have been expected if we had to comply with a strict court order to just open up the gates and let thousands of people out. And so we wanted to avoid that, but also to reset the system in a way that uh, created a more sustainable process. Uh, many people would say it didn't go far enough, and I, and I would probably be the first to say that's probably true. But we achieved what we could, and I think we laid the groundwork for, for future reform. Which we've been seeing. Which we've been seeing in the legislature. Uh, so I, I think it's just a way We've been moving away from a punitive lock them up policy, which is extremely expensive uh, and costly to, to taxpayers and to all of us. And just I, I don't know that it serves our societal goals at the end of the day it, to, to just lock people away and, and believe that they're never going to ever get out or, or, or be better. So you had, took on a new career after leaving the governor's office, and that was? to serve on the California Court of Appeals for the first appellate district here. And did Governor uh, Brown nominate you to the first district court of appeal? He did, he nominated me in uh, October of 2018. And when were you confirmed? I was confirmed in November. Actually, no, I, I may have been confirmed in October. October, November, mm -hmm. I did not take my oath of office until mid-December because I, along with several of my other colleagues, uh, we're not going to leave the governor's office before he was going to leave it. So <laughs> we all we all ended with him uh, when he left his term of governorship, and and I began here with you in Division One, and uh, it really at, at the end of 2018, start of 2019. So our division at that point was made up of you, uh, Justice Jim Humes, Justice Kathy Banky, and me. That's right. And. Um, why don't you describe your experiences uh, being in our division? Well, and you can tell the truth. It's okay. <laughs> I loved my time here. It was a, a wonderful three years. Uh, it, I had every intention of having it be much longer than that. Uh, I felt so welcomed by all of you. I was uh, invigorated by the different cases that come before the division and, and, by, and before the, excuse me, the court, uh, but really the camaraderie, the support, the exchange of ideas and, and the willingness of, of you and all my colleagues to consider different viewpoints and, uh, and persuade each other. Those were all extraordinarily valuable and, and just being a part of that process of writing opinions that can help shape the law and help clarify the law for, for the lower courts and, and on, issue, on issues of novel impression. Those, those were wonderful tasks um, that I enjoyed doing and, and, and would have stayed doing if not for uh, being asked to take on this different job that I had. Yeah, and I think it goes without saying, but I think I speak for the three of us just as soon as Banky and I, when we say it was absolutely a marvelous experience having you as a colleague and we miss you. Um, but um, you decided uh, to try something else. Uh, but before we get into that, I did want to ask you, um, what was it like transitioning uh, to becoming an appellate court justice? Well, I remember in my... Jenny interview, and let, let me backtrack for a second. My, my son Conrad, when I joined the governor's office, was two weeks old. And I remember having an interview with, uh, with Jim, Jim Humes, uh, and with Jonathan Renner, a, a, a colleague who's on the Court of Appeals for the third district in Sacramento. And, and half of their interview was the two of them trying to persuade me not to take the governor's office job <laughs> because I think they wanted to make sure that I understood how difficult it was going to be. And I frankly did not know how I was going to pull it off being a new dad uh, with a newborn son 
and having to find a place to stay and you know how, how was I going to do this and I wasn't sure I knew I was gonna have many sleepless nights but I threw caution to the wind and said I, I can't pass this up uh, and so it's you know that fast forward to uh, dealing with so that I was at the governor's office longer than I expected for seven years. And, and it was challenging. It's you were challenging. You were putting in a lot of hours. The governor was very demanding. He was, uh, but it, he was, he was. He had me on speed dial and we would speak on weekends on frequent occasions. You know, Justice Groban on the Supreme Court knows this well because he has experienced that as well uh, during his time. Uh, but it was a wonderful opportunity to just be able to have these intellectual conversations with the governor with such a capacious mind and, and interest. But there, but there was a tie, it was exhausting at the same time. And, and, and exhausting being away and, and traveling back and forth between here and Sacramento. So to get to my point, when I was at, in the Ginny interview uh, for, for this position, I remember the, when, I, when I was asked the question of, you know, what are you looking forward to for this? And, I, and I'm sure they were, at, they were looking for a very lofty, erudite answer. And I said, I just want to be close to my family. And, and when I realized that that maybe was an incomplete answer for what they were expecting, I, I went into something else. But, but truthfully, there was, I, I appreciated the stability of being here once more and not having to travel to Sacramento and not have to put out fires and, and deal with day-to-day -day things. And really being able to sit with cases and decide for yourself as a constitutional officer what you think is the right outcome. And, and having that time to really think through what those cases mean and, and what the right outcome in your view should be. And, and that was a wonderful position to be in, uh, to be in the position where it was just you deciding what you think is the law should be and the outcome should be. And, 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 and then once you have that decision or idea in mind to try to persuade two other colleagues who are very intelligent and experienced and have their own views and, and more often than not, we tended to agree about things. Uh, and, and, and part of that was because I think we all, we, you know, we tend to see things in similar ways and in, in, in pragmatic and practical ways, but there was also an openness and a collegiality to being persuaded by your colleagues that I think was um, a wonderful experience and one that I have carried over with me to the Ninth Circuit. Are there any particular cases or a case that comes to mind uh, when you sat here or were a member of the First District Court of Appeal that is either significant in your mind or you're particularly proud of? I have a few. Um, I remember a difficult case um, involving um, I think it was uh, Terrence Baker. It, it was a, a case involving uh, someone who had been accused of <coughs> uh, being a sexually violent predator and who had not had a trial in 12 years. And, uh, and in essence, it, you know, this very serious civil commitment proceeding requires a trial and proof beyond a reasonable doubt that someone is a sexually violent predator under the statute, and that trial had not taken place for one reason or another. Not a very sympathetic person in general, given what had happened in his past and what he had done. But nevertheless, it just was very important to me to write an opinion that affirmed what uh, the lower habeas court had done in its own very extensive judicial process of determining why that delay had taken place. Uh, and in affirming the principle that, that there are due process interests that have to be protected, uh, even for people that we may not find very uh, um, sympathetic to. And, and so I, I, that was an important decision and I, and I spent a lot of time writing that opinion. Um, and uh, and my, you know, my colleagues joined me in it. Uh, that was one. I, Another one I think that I very much enjoyed was a constitutional interpretation question, uh, whether uh, property taxation of a, of a church uh, was exempted under the California Constitution for a, a species of tax called the special property tax that 
uh, that postdated uh, this constitutional uh, provision and, and in which later constitutional amendments had not incorporated. Uh, so it was, a, it was an interesting issue, well argued, well briefed. Uh, surprising to me that, that this issue had not been resolved years ago, given how long these, but these constitutional questions arise that way, don't they? And, uh, and so it was, it was important to try to cleave out an answer to that question, which could affect many uh, different uh, churches and, and, uh, and, and just property tax principles, uh, especially with these complex, you know, Proposition 13 and, and all the subsequent ballot, you know, constitutional amendments are not the easiest to decipher. So I try to add my part to, to the discernment of that area of law. Uh, did you find, as some of us have found, that you would be assigned a case and the issue seemed pretty clear cut and you were sure you were going to find either a published or non-published case on this issue and there was none to be found? Yes, <laughs> yes. I, often enough, you think someone else must have answered this question before. Uh, and they haven't, or or there's a wrinkle to that question where right. they may have answered a certain question, but there's there's the add-on that has to be explored and resolved as well, and and that is one of the joys of this job. I, I I've always enjoyed at the appellate level having to learn something new about each particular case, no matter what, and and that was true when I was here in Division One, and 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 it's true now. I always said I know a little about a lot. Right. Because, uh, because you get such a, a, a very cross-section of cases at the appellate level. So um, you, unfortunately, from our perspective, uh, decided to apply for a, a different judicial position, which was? Uh, to serve on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Which is the federal side. The federal side. And uh, what motivated you? to uh, apply for that position? Initially, it was the White House reaching out to me to, uh, because they knew that a position might be opening and uh, would I be interested in considering uh, sending in an application or, 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 being in, or you know, applying for it. And, uh, and I thought about it and uh, I wrestled with it a little bit because it was tough to leave here. And I felt being here that I wanted to really get even better at this job before doing anything else. And so it, it felt a little bit early for me to say yes to it. But after discussing it with my wife and with others and, and the opportunity and, and, and frankly, I, I think I underestimated how much preparation I had already had uh, here. To, to have the confidence to be able to serve on the Ninth Circuit. And so I said yes. And so that began a, a very extensive vetting process to become a federal court judge uh, that took up the better part of three quarters of a year, I'd say, or at least six months before President Biden announced my, my nomination. Uh, by who were you contacted from the White House? Was it the legal department or who contacted you? It was their, their legal department. So people that are, uh, what I would say is the, the White House, of course, is involved in the vetting of, of all these individuals. Uh, they're, they're keenly aware of these different candidates, particularly for the appellate level, uh, but they also rely on senators and, and their committees for the different home state senators to, to provide names and other suggestions as well in, in, in some of the vetting. And so the vetting itself involved both people from the White House staff and the, and the, the Justice Department, but also from the home senators that they felt comfortable with, with uh, agreeing to advance my nomination as well. And um, you and I talked about the process as you were going through it. And um, it was a very rigorous process. Um, and I remember walking into your office and seeing your conference table covered with stacks of mm -hmm. cases. And I, I said, are, are these your cases? And you told me that you were reviewing all of these cases and they weren't yours So in preparing for your Senate hearing. 
Senate committee hearing? Yes, I, I, there's a great deal of preparation. There's a great deal of vetting uh, that goes along with it. It's, it's appropriate. I think it's, you know, an Article Three appointment, a lifetime appointment deserves that level of scrutiny. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's a very arduous process. And, and for a while, it felt as if I was uh, having two jobs at the same time while that was going on. But I did, I, I, I prepared extensively over my own prior history and record and, and my prior opinions that I either wrote or joined in. Uh, I prepared in the work that I had done at the governor's office, thinking that that could be an area of, of questioning as well. And, and then finally, uh, the, I prepared in, in, the, in the sense of areas of interest that the senators might bring up with different areas of law uh, and jurisprudence from the Supreme Court on, on these flashpoint cases. Uh, and so there, there was quite a bit of, there was a wide breadth of, of preparation, not knowing exactly how the Senate hearing would, would shake out, but, but wanting to be ready either way. Who are the two state senators or U.S. Uh, senators from California that supported you? Uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein and Senator Alex Padilla. And um, you had a hearing in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, of which I believe Senator Feinstein uh, was a member. Uh, how yes, actually, and Senator Padilla as well, both of them also, were on the committee. Okay. Yes. And, and for how, how long did the um, hearing take for you? Uh, it took the morning. Uh, we were, what typically happens is the appellate nominee or nominees might attend first at the table uh, on their own. And then the district court nominees that are also set for that hearing date will follow in a, in a subsequent panel. And since I was the only appellate nominee, I was, I was the sole person before the table uh, attending to the senator's questions. And did you make an opening statement? I did. I did. And um, how would you describe the senator's questioning of you? It, it's, uh, I think they reached different areas of questioning, some of them about my resume, some of them about my experience with the governor's office, some about my understanding of different principles of law, such as standing, um, and some which I didn't feel I could answer the questions of because I thought that in giving those answers, it might prejudge or, or give a sense that I might prejudge a case that might come before me. And I think when those exchanges happened, I think some of the senators might were, were, were less than thrilled about it, but uh, understand also it's the practice that has arisen in these conf Senate confirmation hearings for judicial nominees over some time now. And so I think both sides have had to deal with those types of answers from judicial nominees. So the Judiciary Committee approved you and you moved on to the uh, U.S. Senate uh, for confirmation. A confirmation vote. Mm -hmm. Right. Were you in the audience when they uh, voted to confirm you? No, I was. Uh, no. So it, the those confirmation. So it, 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 I got out of committee with actually a couple of, you know, uh, Republican votes to get me out of committee. And then uh, when the time came, initially, I was scheduled to be voted on in. Uh, this is a funny story. In late December, there was a voterama, and there were many. And what year are we in? This was now in December of 2018. Okay. And uh, and at that point, I was the sole appellate nominee with many district court nominees, and uh, in, a, in a smattering of uh, State Department ambassador appointees, and the Senate had to get through these different names, and. Uh, I was the only one that was bumped off of the December Votorama into a January session because uh, there's just a different level of sensitivity, I think, to appointing someone. If, at the if I remember correctly, they got through all these nominees and then got to you and said it's too late and we're tired. I, I think <laughs> I'm being a little right. blunt about it, but. I think that there was a deal made to carry me over to a January session. I would not have to be renominated by the president. Okay. But but essentially it would tee up the vote for for January. So I, it delayed it a little bit into mid-January. 
So on what date in January of 2019 did the Senate uh, confirm you to the Ninth District Court of Appeal? I, you know, I or should, Ninth Circuit, pardon me. I should know this. It was, I think, I want to say January 18th. It was in the third week of January. Uh, but don't quote me on that. I, uh, uh, but it was... Approximately. Approximately in the third week of January uh, or at the very end of the second week of January. So, first of all, can you tell me about what you're doing, what your responsibilities are uh, as a justice in the Ninth Circuit? Judge. Judge. Judge in the Ninth Circuit. And what are the differences and similarities between being a judge in the Ninth Circuit and being a justice in the court of, California Court of Appeal? So the Ninth Circuit is the largest circuit in the country. It encompasses the Western United States. So that it includes matters that come from Montana, Washington State, Oregon, Idaho, California, Nevada, Arizona, Hawaii, Alaska, Guam. Uh, uh, it's a very busy and active court and it ranges the panoply of, of issues that might come up in federal courts, whether it's criminal or immigration, uh, civil, environmental issues, First Amendment, Second Amendment, uh, abortion rights, um, you name it. Those, those issues of importance that come up, agents, administrative agency review, so not just from the district courts, from, from agencies themselves. Uh, and um, the Ninth Circuit has 29 active judges and many more senior judges, so a total of 52 judges on the Ninth Circuit. Uh, and even so, uh, there's a volume of cases. So one of the adjustments that I have had to make in this last year, I was, uh, I was sworn in, in, in on January 25th at the end of January and, and have served you know, the better part of close to a year now. And, uh, and we serve on three judge panels, just as we did here in California. Uh, but I sit in argument uh, in different cities, uh, and 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 the panel hears cases from the, from those arguments, and then ultimately disposes of them with opinions or dispositions. And then there's also an en banc process, which is a process that can set or or reset circuit authority uh, across the entire Ninth Circuit. Right. So when you sit en banc, that's all the Ninth Circuit. Judges, correct? Well, it's it's a, a panel of eleven judges okay. because it, it would just be too unwieldy to try it, all twenty nine. And it, it, um, is it when you meet on Bonk? Is that on a rotational basis, or is it done uh, random? Is selection of the judges done randomly? It's selected by random draw, and so. In essence, an on the, the reason why an on so one of the principal distinctions between California appellate court and Ninth Circuit is that previously, if, if our panel disagreed with a point of law or the outcome of a case from what a different state appellate court panel had decided, we were free to decide decided that way. Right, to disagree. To disagree. And you'd have conflicting cases. And you'd have conflicting cases, and, and the California Supreme Court would either address that conflict or not. In the Ninth Circuit, uh, a, a prior panel that disposes of an issue uh, in a published authority binds the Ninth Circuit. That is now Ninth Circuit precedent for all panels to apply. And the only way to uh, change the determination of a, of a panel is through the en banc process. Uh, with what, you know, with a small caveat that if there's a very clear intervening Supreme Court case where, where, where the prior panel's decision stands in clear conflict with it, that, that might give a little leeway for a panel to decide something differently. But, but really the en banc process is the way to clarify and, and amend Ninth Circuit law for, across the circuit. How does a case come before an en banc panel? So what will happen first is that the, uh, a, a three-judge panel will determine the outcome of a case. They'll publish an opinion. Sometimes a party may file a petition for rehearing or uh, for panel rehearing or petition for rehearing on banc. Sometimes those petitions don't arise, but it, it catches the interest of, a, of, of one of the judges in the Ninth Circuit. And ultimately, if they think that it merits a different decision than what the panel arrived at, 
uh, they may call it en banc. Now, the en banc process is not simply to just correct supposed errors from a panel. It has to take on significant questions of law or where the panel's decision uh, creates an inter-circuit split. So th those are the two main factors that apply when, when calling a, a case en banc. So the three, uh, well, the three-judge panel either puts out an opinion or can sometimes put out a memo? Uh, um, a disposition, a memorandum disposition, which is a non-citable uh, authority, typically much shorter, much more cursory. Uh, but sometimes en bancs will take that anyway. We'll, we'll, we'll take that up if, if, if there seems to be, there's an important enough interest you know, that's grounded in, 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 what, in that decision that conflicts either with another circuit or with, or, or, or with uh, the views of a majority of the judges on the Ninth Circuit. And so the en banc process is yet another layer of activity in which to, uh, for, the, for the judges of the circuit to determine, consistent with Supreme Court authority, what the law of the circuit should be. And in and, and only a fraction of cases that are called on bank actually make it on bank because you need a majority of non-recused active judges to vote for it. This is of 11? Uh, no, so the, the, of, of the 29. Okay. So a majority of those non-recused active judges must vote f for something to go on bank for it to happen. And then once that does, then the random draw of who the 11 on the panel shall be and the prior panel decision is vacated. And so it's, it is now a new 11 judge en banc panel that will determine the outcome of that case and, and, and publish the, the law. So there's more layers to the Ninth Circuit process than uh, a state uh, California appellate court process, it sounds like. There is, primarily by nature of the fact that a, a panel decision is binding and, and becomes Ninth Circuit law for, for everyone. Um, how did you find the transition from the First District Court of Appeal, State Court of Appeal, to the Ninth Circuit? Well, uh, since it's such, it, there's a lot of differences. There were a lot of differences. I would say because of the volume of cases in the Ninth Circuit, many of the cases are resolved by this memorandum disposition process. Uh, whereas here, every one of the decisions that the State Appellate Court issues is a fully written opinion, much longer. But not all of them are published. Right. And so I, one of the changes in, 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 in my own transition was the focus in the Ninth Circuit it tends to be, uh, much more of my time is devoted to preparing for the oral argument calendars that happen you know, over the course of an entire week. You can explain why. You told me about this earlier, right. but um, Oral argument can go on for a week, correct? Monday through Friday? Yes. And how many cases a day on average do you have for oral argument? You know, originally scheduled, it can be five or six cases per day. Uh, some of those will get submitted, and so they won't be resolved by oral argument, but resolved outside of the oral argument process. And so, you know, it, you can even have even three or four argued cases per day over the course of an entire week. And it adds up. And, and some of those will become published opinions eventually. And so there's a, a considerable degree of attention paid to preparing for those oral arguments. And uh, rather than writing as many fully written opinions as, as, as used to occur. Whereas here, the first district, each division is scheduled for two days of oral argument. And generally, you can do it, we can do it in one day. Right. And so maybe I've, max, I've seen 14 cases, which is unusual. Right. You know, it's more on average of like seven. Right. So that's a big difference. And another one is uh, the practice here of circulating draft opinions beforehand. So that, and, and, and generally getting a sense from your panel members whether there's at, at least pr provisional agreement in the, in the way that the draft opinion is approaching the case or not. Uh, in many of these panels that I sit on, it can, you know, with, with many of my colleagues, many more colleagues now than before, 
plus visiting judges, it is not clear how the case is going to shape up f from the panel's perspective until I am actually at the oral argument and listening to their questions. Uh, and then we have conference afterwards and, and we flesh out where we stand on these particular issues. And then the opinions drafted. And then, and then the opinions drafted. And so, I, you know, the, I, some of my colleagues on the Ninth Circuit have remarked, and, and including ones that have come from the state appellate system, that it does lead to a more open process of engagement at the oral argument stage than perhaps the state appellate process has. And I think there's some semblance to it. I, and I know you about this about you, I, I always try to keep an open mind, of course, uh, you know, with, with arguments. And I, and I can remember occasions where I had written something and, and decided to change my mind based on the basis of the argument that happened. Uh, which we do. Which we do. Um, but I, I suppose there could be something said for the fact that if you haven't had that prior discussion or, or agreement or, or, or even back and forth between the panel members before the argument, it, it, it's an even more open process. Um, my impression is that at least here in our division, there was more face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contact with colleagues and discussions, whereas with the Ninth Circuit, you, you have colleagues from all over the Western region of the U.S., and they aren't necessarily all in the same courthouse. That is true. And there are judges sitting all throughout the Western United States, but I will say, we make the effort to travel and see each other in person. We attend conferences together. Uh, it is important to be there in person. You know, the pandemic really altered that for a time. But I think we all understand the importance of, of being together in person and interacting uh, both in conference and outside of particular merits panels. Uh, to get to know one another better or, or to really hash out differences face to face rather than over email or, or over different uh, published writings. So it sounds like to me you're very enthusiastic uh, about being on the Ninth Circuit and, uh, are really, and you are really enjoying uh, the job there. I think that's a fair statement. It's, it's an exciting time. I, I, I suppose one other thing that I should mention is. Uh, I hire annual law clerks right. in the tradition that I came in. And I have four clerks that come in each term. And uh, I, it, you know, it, it has its double edges. I, these are very bright, intelligent, young, earnest lawyers who are starting their careers. Uh, and, uh, and there's a wonderful mentoring process that I engage in with them. Where, and, I, and I think back to my time with Judge Pius and how much he taught me and, and I try to do the same and, and have an open door policy and, and a very cohesive and familial atmosphere in my chambers. Um, you know, but there is also the part of not having experienced attorneys right from the start where you have to help them uh, hone their writing and, and, and their focus on cases and what might matter in some ways more than others. And so there's, it's a process that repeats itself each year. Uh, I find it invigorating and I think it's great to have fresh insight from people coming in each year. Uh, but it takes a little bit of extra labor and, and it's a labor of love to find these individuals each year and to go through a, an extensive hiring process and to mentor them. And, but they become your colleagues uh, for, for many years to come. Now, uh, are you still involved in any uh, organizations or volunteer work? Currently, I, I'm mostly involved. I sit on the board of the Pacific Council, uh, which is a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan organization in Los Angeles that promotes civic engagement with international issues. And so I, I'm a board member and, uh, and have been a member of the Pacific Council for many years. Uh, and so I, I enjoy spending time with uh, my fellow members and, and helping chart the the organization's course and to attend their conferences as well. And What's the course? Uh, well, it, it, it involves uh, international and U.S. government and, and, and uh, foreign relations between our citizens or with, with our government, with other countries, and, and issues of interest that we should all be interested in. Um, and so, for example, I, I and other delegates went to the United Arab Emirates on a trip in March of last year 
to meet with government officials there and to get a better understanding of of the UAE and its uh, regional relationships and, it, and its relationships, both positive and negative with the US government. Uh, so it's, um, it's an important process where I think w w one of the interests of the organization is, is that foreign policy shouldn't just be left to our government officials, but that there's important appropriate civic engagement with all of us, with, with NGOs, with others, to, to be a part of those conversations and, and to do our part to, to help foster a global community. So over the several years you've been on the bench, have you developed any particular judicial philosophy? I would say, well, I guess I would harken back to a point I made with, with you before. I, I, I'm pragmatic in the sense that, to me, the judging is more of an art form than a science. I think we, we take many different disparate pieces of information and we do the best we can to resolve it based on precedent, based on our methods of statutory interpretation, uh, based on the consequences of our decisions, uh, based on the facts and the record. Uh, I, I don't portray, I, I don't think of myself as, a, as, as lying in any one particular camp. Uh, I'm not a strict textualist, even though I would start with the text when it comes to statutory interpretation. But then the text has its own context with related provisions, with legislative history, with, with other markings of, of what legislative intent or congressional intent might be. And similarly with constitutional provisions. And so uh, it, it's important, I think, to take in these different areas of information and to do the best you can with them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, I, I don't want to describe myself in a way that suggests that I'm just going to make up the law that I think as it should be, because that is not our role. It, it, it is a role of judges to interpret the law and to apply it faithfully and to come up with what you think is the right answer of what, of what legislative bodies have chosen for, for the law uh, and, and, and those meanings. But at the end of the day, when the Senate chooses someone or, or, or a different body chooses their judges, I think they're imbuing a sense of trust that this person has the right judgment and temperament to decide those questions faithfully and fairly and, and in a neutral way. And so I, it's less of a judicial philosophy and, and more of a pragmatic approach that I understand all these things weigh in there and, and not, no one issue, no one factor is dispositive. And as long as you do the best you can to arrive at that result and explain it in a clear enough way with your opinions, then others can agree to it or not, but, but it's subject to interpretation and challenge from others. Did you author any dissents when you were with the First District Court of Appeal? I did. Uh, one of my dissents was uh, with, I dissented from Justice Humes in a, in a case called People versus Fox where we had uh, differing interpretations of a change in law that the California legislature had enacted to allow uh, judges to exercise discretion in striking a firearm enhancement and, uh, and whether that law should, wh whether a person should be allowed to withdraw from their plea agreement in order to try to gain the benefit of that law. Uh, and uh, it was a good process because Jim and I, you know, Justice Humes and I, of course, were our, our, our dear friends and colleagues from before. And, and it well, was, you both worked in the uh, both worked at the governor's office, right? Governor Brown's administration. And so it was it was interesting that right off the bat, I was dissenting from my former colleague. But but, you know, but that's the point. You know, we, we do this because we we do what we think is is the right answer. And, and, and what was important about that process is that we were able to come to closer positions to each other based on our writings back and forth where I, I think I helped you know narrow parts of his majority opinion and I think he helped shape my response and in, to my dissent but ultimately I, I continued to dissent because I felt differently than 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 the majority did on this particular issue and and at the end of the day when when the Supreme Court took up a related case involving these issues I think uh, I think Justice Corrigan agreed with some of what I had thought and with some of what Justice Humes had thought. So, 
Uh, bo both of us were only partially correct <laughs> in that case. As sometimes happens right. when it goes up to the uh, California Supreme Court. Um, have you dissented? Or, uh, filed uh, or written any dissents in the Ninth Circuit yet? I have a dissent that is going to be filed very soon uh, related to uh, the uh, IDEA, the the, uh, the Education Act that uh, requires school districts to provide for uh, supportive services for, for children in, in, in need. Uh, and uh, that hasn't been filed yet, but it but it will be filed pretty soon. Do you think dissents serve a purpose? I do, I do. There there is a freedom to writing a dissent uh, that you don't find with a majority opinion. When you're when you're writing for the majority, you're writing for the court, and you're taking a consensus consensus view of of the case. And and sometimes with the dissent, it's to highlight your differences of view with the majority uh, and potentially for something for someone else to take up that issue or, or to provide insight to a different panel down the road. Uh, and it gives you more freedom to be able to just speak your own truth, your own perspective about how you think the law should be interpreted. And so I, I, I don't mind writing a dissent. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to be able to persuade your colleagues to a majority side, but uh, I, I do think the dissent serves a purpose in, in shedding light and, and adding another voice on, on, on a legal perspective that might be taken up or, or perhaps might be a majority one day. Do you think the role of the judiciary has changed in any aspect since you've taken the bench? Since I've taken the bench? Mm -hmm. I don't know that the role that the judiciary has taken on a different role. I, what I think the challenge is to reinforce the importance of the role that judiciary serves for our society as a stabilizing force, as a, as a place where people can come to resolve disputes uh, in, 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 and have faith that up or down, the court is going to decide it fairly and neutrally. Um, I think that that has been the judicial role for since the inception of our country but it's taken on a bit more urgency perhaps today, given the loss of faith in our many public institutions. And, um, and so I don't know that the judiciary is taking on a different role, but I think it's taking on a particularly important role now in times of a loss of confidence in our institutions and, and, uh, and perhaps resorting to other modes of uh, trying to resolve disputes. Do you think, in general, the public's perception of the judiciary has changed? I think and it how has. So? I I think it has. I because I, I I think it stands in line with the public's perception of other institutions that there has been a loss of confidence in in the workings of these institutions and and whether they serve that stabilizing presence as they have before. I think the courts have not been immune to that. Um, I think there are certain decisions that have come out of the Supreme Court that help perhaps raise questions uh, uh, about um, why judges decide cases the way they do. Um, I, there, there's an aspect to the confirmation process that I went through where the fact that I got three Republican votes almost seems like a, a, a big deal compared to just 10 years ago when some colleagues would get 98 votes. You know, there's uh, the sense that judges should be tied to the president that's appointed them, unfortunately, pervades in the media and in, 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 in press accounts. And I think that does a disservice to the judges themselves who, by and large, whoever I meet, state and federal really hold that job very dearly and, and want to do the best they can to decide these matters neutrally and fairly and faithfully and not based on some sort of political affiliation. But I, I, but I do think there's been a little bit of a loss in confidence from the public that that is the way that it actually happens. What do you think, if anything, are uh, the current challenges confronting the courts? 
or the judiciary. Restoring a little, a little more sense of confidence in, in our judicial system is one. Uh, I think continuing to try to improve the accessibility of the courts to people is another. Uh, you know, we we are ensconced in a legal profession and legal world where we are, where many of us know each other and. Uh, attorneys will frequently appear before us and, and, and we'll know the regular players. And it's sometimes easy, easy to forget uh, that other people may not even understand the very beginnings of what the judicial process is or how to file a complaint or, or how to reach out for legal services. And, uh, and I think it's incumbent on us as judges to, um, to uh, make those connections more prevalent in our communities. I, I try to speak with students at all levels, not just law students, but high school students and even younger, because I want them to see a judge sitting there and talking to them and, and perhaps having them picture one day, maybe I might want to do that. Uh, or, um, or, or to legal professions and you know, to lawyers and, and have them maybe inspire them to think, well, maybe I might want to be a judge one day as well. And so I think it's important for us to try to maintain these connections and, and, uh, and have the judicial system seem more accessible to, to people and, and, uh, and reinforce the job that we do and demystify the job that we do so that people understand that we really are these public servants that try to do their level best to answer questions fairly. If you had to do anything differently, uh, or is, is there anything you would have done differently in your professional career, or are you satisfied with how your career has progressed? It's hard to say that I would choose anything differently because you know whether you've had achievements or, or had some failures along the way, they help shape you. And, uh, and for me, I find myself in a very fortunate position to do a job that I love, that has an impact. And uh, so it's hard to look back on it and, and say, I would have wanted something else to happen uh, because things have worked out in a, in a pretty good way. And, uh, and I'm happy with the role that I'm in and, and excited about the possibility of continuing to do an even better job in, in, in what I do now. What have been the rewards of being a judicial officer, if any? Well, you know, it's uh, one of the largest ones is uh, having the ability to have a voice in the outcome of each individual case. Uh, every case is important to someone. And so sometimes we will have cases that are important to many people and, 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 the, and the published opinion will impact many cases. But even with those smaller ones, it's going to mean something to the litigants in that matter. And, uh, and so I've been proud that I try to devote a lot of energy with the small ones as well as the big ones uh, and do my best to answer those questions. I appreciate the mentoring that I'm able to do with my law clerks and the camaraderie that I feel for my fellow judges. Uh, and it's, uh, it still feels new enough to me that there's a great deal of excitement about, about, the, the next, the, about this stage of my judicial profession and, 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 and how it might shape. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm excited for, for what's to come as much as for what's happened already. Um, has your judicial career imposed any limits on your lifestyle or outside activities? Yes. Uh, as you know, it's, it's very difficult to speak in public about things. Uh, uh, I, I clearly don't have any social media presence and, and I'm quite fine with that. Uh, but, uh, it does, it does limit what one can say in public or, or to even attending public events because it is very, and, and, and for very understandable reasons, uh, you know, we, we want to have both an act and an appearance that, that independence and judicial integrity that we are not uh, cast in one camp or another based on our activities. 
and so that that does restrict what what we can do uh, but but it's a it's an appropriate limitation I think on uh, based on the importance of the work that we do so I'd like to end this by asking you what do you like to do when you're not sitting on the bench or doing research or grafting travel uh, so I, I, I enjoy going to other countries uh, or visiting other places or, or national parks with my family. Uh, I uh, enjoy the occasional bike ride on the weekends or a, or a hike, seeing friends, uh, catching up on a book. I, I've, I've not read as much as I've li I'd like to, but, but every once in a while I'll carve, carve out some time to do some nighttime reading uh, and uh, Mostly enjoying time with my family and, and watching my son grow and and uh, really enjoying each moment as as he gets older because you know he's only going to be a ten or eleven year old and for for so long and 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 everything changes so just living in the moment and enjoying him. Is there anything else we need to cover that um, I haven't asked you about? No, you have been uh, very thorough. I, I appreciate the, the chance for us to chat and, and uh, appreciate seeing you and, and Jim and Kathy again. Well, thank you very much uh, for participating in this interview. And um, I found it insightful and engaging. And I learned some things about you I didn't know. And I want to thank you, Justice Margulies, uh, and the Legacy Project for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about myself today. I think it's a wonderful idea, and I was so pleased when you reached out to, to ask me to participate. And, uh, and it brings back fond memories to be back here in Division I and, and walking down this hallway and, and, and speaking with you. So I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to have this conversation with you this afternoon. It was my great pleasure to conduct uh, the interview, and don't be a stranger.